Hello, hello. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome after a, a two-month summer break to um, Culture Tensions, uh, the fifth in our series this year uh, of um, pertinent uh, discussions, uh, open dialogue, um, on some of the topical and hot issues of our times within arts, society, culture, and uh, history. Um, gives me great pleasure to um, introduce this uh, particular discussion on decolonizing the arts. Um, I think we, we are having these dialogues and conversations across um, the Western world, and uh, it seems uh, to be also the case within Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and uh, certainly ignited much more so uh, with uh, the Ukrainian, um, well, the Russian war on Ukraine. Um, so we're going to have quite an interesting, nuanced um, uh, perspectives on uh, the idea of what um, uh, decolonization means and what that um, um, is within uh, an arts context. Um, my name is Malik Govinda. Um, so I'm one of the co-curators of uh, Culture Tensions. Uh, you'll meet uh, Agnieszka in a minute, my fellow co-curator. Um, and um, I just want to open some you know, general thoughts uh, about the, uh, the, this discussion. Um, because um, very recently, I think only about three, four weeks ago, uh, the International Council of Museums um, uh, published uh, a, a series of uh, essays and uh, uh, articles and think pieces called um, Towards Decolonization. Um, and what's interesting about that document, particularly for people who work in museums, um, is that they seem to not be able to define what decolonization means. They describe it as an ongoing process, uh, that it is unfinished. And uh, it is a way to heal uh, a, a, the kind of collective colonial wounds uh, in, uh, in, in, um, uh, across the globe. Um, but they said in the paper, in the introduction, that they decided to avoid privileging a single definition for decolonization. So it seems that decolonization is not simply about returning objects uh, back to uh, a certain homeland that it may have been taken from um, by force, theft, or voluntarily, uh, but something more than that. Uh, it has relationships to a spiritual return, uh, the idea of the sacred, um, uh, idea of a sacred knowledge that's been lost, and also about reclaiming memory and reconnecting again with history. But also the activists are talking about uh, decolonization. Activists are talking about reconquering the museum and the art institutions. So that's the context that um, the museum curators are coming from um, when they talk about decolonization. We're hoping to kind of give some alternative perspectives to the dominant discourses uh, around that. Um, but I'm sure we'll be touching on some of those uh, 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 thoughts. So I'm going to introduce our fantastic uh, guest speakers um, in order of, um, uh, how, when, uh, of their presentations. Um, so first, my, my sidekick, um, uh, Agnieszka Koleg. Uh, Agnieszka Koleg is um, a curator, and she is um, an artist herself, um, trained as a visual artist. Um, she uh, co-founded the Passion for Freedom Arts Festival, uh, which took place in London um, uh, before COVID, so about 2017 might have been the last one. 2018. 2018. But we then did a collaboration in Denmark and then in Poland. Yes. Yeah, alive and kicking. Alive and kicking still, which is great. Um, and um, uh, Passion for Freedom um, supports um, artists who are forbidden to, ex to exhibit their work. Um, and um, most of them came from very difficult uh, countries with theocratic regimes, um, many of them women. Um, so uh, Agnieszka is a real champion for freedom of speech and freedom of thought. Um, she survived the terror attack in Copenhagen in 2015, um, which um, uh, ironically was a discussion on freedom of expression. Um, but. Uh, during the, after the attack, she continued with the meeting um, um, and uh, said to the public that was still there that 
they not only want to kill us, they want to stop us from talking, so we should continue talking. Second um, guest speaker is uh, Piotr Juskowitz. Juskowitz. Sorry, forgive my pronunciations in Polish. I'm still trying to master it. Um, but Piotr is an eminent art historian and professor at the Adam Mikwitz uh, University in Poznan. Uh, he lectures uh, at the Institute of Art History over there. His interests include 20th century art history, contemporary art, and art criticism from the 18th to the 20th centuries. He's received many grants and fellowships from Cambridge University, the Getty Grant Program, um, Edinburgh University, numerous. Um, he um, has edited publications. Um, examples include uh, um, the melancholic the melancholy of Jacek Malkowicz, Malkowski, Malchowski, um, and many other um, journals um, on artists such as um, uh, Marcel Duchamp and um, uh, the, the, uh, Polish modernism, uh, post-Stalinist um, um, art, art, and um, and so forth. He's um, uh, we're very pleased to have him here, and he's currently working on an exhibition on. Um, uh, post-World War II modernism uh, in Poland at uh, which museum, is it? Uh, the exhibition? Yeah. Yeah, uh, this is um, uh, uh, exhibition. <laughs> uh, exhibition, uh, which is, um, uh, uh, the title of the exhibition is uh, uh, Regulated Modernity, and it's about uh, modernism uh, during the communist time in Poland. Okay, thank you. Um, then our third guest speaker, um, fellow uh, Brit, <laughs> um, so myself and Inea uh, from, from the UK. Um, Inea, um, welcome, and um, um, you can read her biography uh, on, on the website, um, but just to kind of give you a, a quick summary, uh, Inea Folarin Iman uh, is a broadcaster, a journalist, commentator, and a campaigner. She's regularly appeared on um, uh, the media uh, as a panelist on BBC Radio 4, BBC Politics Live. Um, originally, she was also uh, one of the guest broadcast, one of the broadcasters rather of uh, uh, GB News. Um, she also founded uh, a very important um, uh, organisation, uh, uh, and she's the director of an organisation called the Equiano Project, uh, which is a forum promoting freedom of speech and open dialogue on various subjects uh, touching on race, identity, and culture. Um, she's co-convened uh, uh, a very brilliant, I must say, uh, conference that I went to earlier this year, uh, which was a transatlantic conference on race and identity politics at the University of Cambridge, um, bringing together both uh, British and American um, uh, thinkers, mainly uh, uh, thinkers of, of people of color. Um, she uh, has re written regular columns for the Telegraph and the Sunday Telegraph, uh, and she's also um, a trustee, I believe, of the National Portrait Gallery. So we might hear some uh, interesting thoughts uh, from on that issue. Um, so, yes, a free speech champion, I would say, uh, and uh, a really good one at that. So without further uh, ado, I'm going to give each of our speakers about 15 minutes each. Um, and Jeske, you're, you're our first um, uh, presenter. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, my presentation at the beginning will be quite heavy on text. So please excuse me. Um, so normally when I'm preparing for our discussions, I usually try to find um, a space, a gap, where I could throw in provocation. So being aware of our guests' background and what they're talking about, I was thinking what I can contribute myself. So um, I thought that I would look into... Um, if, uh, Krzysztof, if we don't put the slides yet, please. Um, so uh, I thought that we would look into whether we are not being colonized now, because I think a lot about the colonization is turning towards the past, and depending on the angle, it could be a very distant past or it could be not so distant past, but it's past. And now I wanted to look into what's happening currently. What are we under influence? 
So, um, just a little bit of a background, um, because not, obviously not everyone has been coming to previous discussions. I was born and brought up in Poland at the time of communism, and this left a big mark uh, on my way of perceiving the world and the ruling classes. And in a sense, I think the, the best way to describe it would be that it's with suspicion and the double checking whether what they say, what they do, is actually in agreement. And I left Poland um, 22 years ago uh, as a young adult, and I was quite naive to think that in the West people um, understand freedom, they cherish it, and they would not easily give it away. I lived in Britain for 20 years. I returned to Poland um, before Christmas 2021. Why I returned, and actually Inaya asked me that today because we know each other from London, uh, is because I was exhausted by the lack of freedom of speech, um, the fact that the British police became really politicized, that it looked and it manifests that in a sense there is more likelihood to be arrested or visited by the police because of what you posted online then if there is a third theft, burglary, mugging in the street, this seems not to cause such a, such a trouble with the police. They seem to um, say that it's like of a lower importance uh, to investigate and just, they just over flooded with these cases, so they're not even going to look into that. And then obviously, in relation to the terror attack I survived, um, it, it has been a huge concern to me, the fragmentation of the society and the constant threats of the terror attacks uh, from Islamists. And a month, month after I moved to Poland, the war broke out and Russia invaded Ukraine and the EU elites were shocked. Uh, the elites shock and disbelief um, horrified me uh, because it kind of showed me how dependent we are on their decision-making, and how this threatens our own existence. Now I am based in Brussels. I received an offer from Frank Furedi, Professor Frank Furedi, to work with him at MCC Brussels, which is a new think tank, which is supposed to challenge this monoculture and one way of looking at things and analyzing them. And in relation to the event we have here today, talking about decolonizing arts, we're talking about museums and we have an excellent uh, report on the politicizations of the museums produced by Kathleen Deme, which would be published on Monday. So I invite you to look on our webpage to read the report. Um, tonight, uh, I wanted to talk about the colonization of arts now and museums and Western institutions. Um, now, for a long time, many thinkers and commentators, not only in Poland, but also abroad, have been talking about the heavy influence of American culture. Uh, Britain seems to catch whatever new viru, vi mind viru, virus appears in the States uh, straight away. <laughs> All of us seem to follow later. Uh, we are not immune to that um, in Poland either. Uh, we got used to being influenced by music, games, um, uh, popular culture, streaming services that seems to be producing endless hours of content. Now, we only seem to notice um, that when the dosage has been increased and it really feels like it's tipping into propaganda, especially in the movies. Apart from this and indirect uh, influence seeping into our consciousness, we are being animated by other actors and shaped into new societies based on values often detached from their roots. Because what I often experience is that the words are being said, but nothing stands behind it. And that was the case in Britain with the increase of terror attacks when there was the prevent program being introduced and there was the whole conversation about that uh, schools need to teach and uphold British values. And all of a the sudden, there was the whole conversations about, ooh, what are they, and are we really upholding them? And one of them was freedom of speech and uh, liberty, but then actually you, we were not practicing that, so it, they were empty words. So uh, we see that as well. Uh, I see three, three main routes uh, where these influence and colonization of us and our minds and our culture could happen. One of them, which is a huge one, is funding programs. 
because artists, obviously, they could either work within the commercial sphere, but then the other sphere would be institutions, and then institutions, you either go to the, to the nation-based institutions, or you rely on the NGOs, um, international bodies, or institutions that are multinational, uh, for example, like pan-European, European Union. The other sphere of influence in colonizing us is obviously the in international organizations. So as Manik mentioned, the uh, uh, Forum for Museums, how they decide on the new definitions of museums and what they should be doing. They set the agenda, then if you're not following that, it seems you're not professional, you're not going with the progress. That's also something that we can question whether this is progress or not. Uh, and then um, these professional bodies, they set up the global agendas and then national elites, international elites, they, that they aspire to this global status, they use um, different means, main, mainstream media and other forms of influence to herd, in a sense, these unenlightened uh, masses towards this kind of bright, digital, atomized future. Now, I looked into major funds source, sources that are used for the production of arts and culture and the creative elite within European Union. Uh, and I'm curious uh, what the audience would think, so I'm open to questions afterwards and the discussion on that. So the first one is the Erasmus Plus program. Um, all of these programs, they, they work together with the European Commission they have the guidelines and the budgets set up by them. So the guidelines uh, for the Erasmus Plus program and the budget for the years 2021 and 2027, the budget is 26.2 billion euros. That's nearly the double of the, uh, of the previous budget. Um, and the program places a strong focus on social inclusion the green and digital transitions, and promoting young people's participation in democratic life. So on the surface, it looks really good. Nothing wrong with that, you might say. Now looking closer into the guidelines and what it says. So one of the focus areas is raising awareness about European common values and participation in civic society. So it was very hard to find the, uh, the exact definitions here, so I had to dig deeper. And then I found the list, which is outlined in the Article 2 of the Treaty of Lisbon. And here I would like to pause and add that the Lisbon Treaty is the same one that was criticized by its opponents uh, for centralizing the EU and weakening democracy by moving power away from national electorates. And here it sounds really good, these common values, European values, human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities, uh, are values which are shared by EU member states. Um, now, I wonder whether the common shared values underpinning the lifelong learning through European Exchange Program respects the individual civic engagement in pursuing interests that might be specific to their nation, to their situation within specific geographic location uh, and geopolitics of that, of that place. The other area's um, focus uh, is innovation. Now here we have combating climate change, which begs the question how well the science is settled on that and whether this is not a political tool for something else. Clean energy, directly linked with the above, with added layer of um, exposure to the Russian gas supplies by many countries in Europe that pursued this goal until recently. And this is something that came out with the begin the, the start of the war. Now, what the results of that would be, these programs and this money poured into that, we will see as the first steps uh, taken towards that seem to be restricting uh, individual citizens' uh, freedom and not necessarily producing innovation. The guide states further down that in the investment in knowledge, skills, and competence, uh, competences uh, will benefit individuals, institutions, organizations, and society as a whole by contributing to the sustainable growth and ensuing equity, prosperity, and social inclusion in Europe and beyond. And here again, I had the red light because the equity is this kind of buzzword where the trouble starts. 
Equality focuses on the equal rights of the individual. Equity demands that groups, not the individual, have comparable outcomes. Here, I would urge our audience to research how equity might look like in practice and best to search for examples in the United States and slowly in Britain as well. So if anything, maybe Inaya could give you some examples if you have questions. The guideline stresses intersectional factors of discrimination, signaling that the program subscribes to political ideology of identity politics, which we have discussed in the Culture Tensions September 2022 discussion. And priority will be given to projects aimed at developing competences in various green sectors. The program supports the use of innovative practices to make learners, staff, and youth workers true actors of change. Again, the question is, what does it mean uh, that you're going to influence particular culture, arts in your own country, having the agenda set far, far away from it? It also talks about enabling behavioral changes. Again, we might question whether this is just um, innocent or whether this is more like social engineering. Now, also, the program is uh, asked to reach out and engage with a wide spectrum of players in the society, like NGOs um, and other organizations. What is interesting for me, where is the place for democratically elected national governments to have a say in that? So this is one of the big tools being used. And uh, the other one is the Creative Europe program, and here, the main focus is, again, the Green Deal. Um, also, um, now the new thing that started to be uh, promoted from uh, 2021, push for European democracy. Uh, and here it says about speaking truth to power, the arts can test the resilience of the rule of law and Europe's precious democracy. Amateur and professional actors collaborate to bring these issues to new and wider audiences. And here we have one of the presented uh, projects, which uh, is called Reimagine Europe. And it says about the project, a vibrant project implemented by 10 cultural organizations with the support from the European Commission's Creative Europe program. Its aim is to reach out to new audiences and encourage reflections on some of the social and political challenges that threaten to draw European nations apart, such as nationalism, climate change, and migration. Again, the question is how much of that is independent thinking, how much of that is being directed, and what comes through that. And just before I finish, I wanted to um, add some visuals. Uh, I already showed them when we had a discussion in, in July last year. That was a big um, social media campaign uh, at the time when the war was raging for a few months in Ukraine, and this is what was being promoted through the, through the program. Krzysztof, uh, would you be so kind and put the slides? So at that time, there was this big social media campaign, so the future is queer, and what we found interesting with Manik, that it was very um, obvious what kind of agenda is being promoted, because it was all very combative. So... Here, you can see that makes me sad and combative. Uh, it was about the, the, neuro, uh, the heteronormativity is wrong, um, the future is queer. So it wasn't just about tolerance, it was actually about setting up a new vision for the society. So I found it quite disturbing that this is being sponsored and promoted as... as um, pan-European program. So I'm quite curious what, what uh, the audience and the guests think about different forms of colonization of our arts, art, art programs and artists and creative elites in the present time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Agnieszka. We're going to move straight to Piotr's uh, presentation. There will be time to uh, ask questions after all three presentations. Piotr? Um, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for your kind um, introduction. And 
Uh, because I uh, expected that the, most of the public uh, will be um, uh, Polish speaking, so I uh, decided uh, to, to, to give a talk in Polish. And <clears throat> so let me start by saying that when Manik uh, sent us the test, text with the invitation, he stressed three issues that he wanted to talk about. The first one talked uh, about the conquest and subjugation of some societies by others and um, saying that these are present in human history since we started to record it. Manik asked us why we pay so much attention and why we criticize so intensely. Most of all, European colonialism and European culture, and not some other kinds of colonialism, even though the colonial processes were something universal throughout history. The second issue concerns the impact of political activism born on the basis of post-colonial ideas on the field of art, which uh, can be seen as a revision of the existing canon of the shape of museum collections, the symbols present in public space, and even the curricula of academic art courses, including art history. This revision is supposed to reveal the hegemonic content generated in the world of art and also to unveil the silent circumstances of how works of art are created using the material effects of colonial exploitation. The third matter is a question, quite interesting, a question about the usefulness of a post-colonial perspective in interpreting artistic phenomena in Central and Eastern Europe, including Poland, taking into account the fact that these countries were suffered, were victims of Russian and German expansion, colonial expansion over the at least past three centuries. I would like to answer those questions, pointing out, first of all, a fundamental feature of post-colonial studies, not as an anthropologist or political scientist, but rather as an art historian without entering into a huge discussion about the nature of those studies and their history. In my opinion, an important breakthrough in this field started with the classic book by Edward Said, Orientalism, from 1978, which was uh, later published, in, um, translated into Polish. So unlike other studies about colonialism, which were pro-emancipation in character. So unlike those studies and statements, Said tied the issues of colonialism to discourse, according to Michel Foucault's theory, which had quite important consequences. So Foucault, similar to other um, French Enlightenment uh, thinker, thought heirs, characterize the human subject as an object of social shaping, as a blank slate that can be written upon in any way, whose identity can be shaped in any given way with uh, social factors. While for Derrida uh, or Lyotard, the factor shaping identity, shaping individuals was language, most of all, in case of Foucault, those were power relations. They shaped society, according to him, by internalizing the structure through discourse in individuals. Speaking of discourse, what I mean, a discourse is a set of statements on a certain topic that has specific boundaries of what is said and what is not said. And what is extremely important, discourse is, from the point of view of Foucault, is similar to other social practices, including the fact that they influence, they exert influence, and then change into 
institutions. So when he studies medical discourse, he wants to show how that translates into medical institutions that uh, have uh, society as uh, their uh, part of their practice. They practice upon society. Said uh, also defined the effects of colonialism as the result of pressure of the dominant discourse, the discourse of the colonizers, representing their worldview created by the colonizers, and at the same time, referring to Foucault, it's an instrument of power in connection with the system of values it forces up on people. It establishes moral principles, the boundaries of what is civilized and what is barbaric, uh, establishes culture of supremacy, boundaries of subject identity, etc. In this perspective, post-colonial studies are the practice of critical analysis with some hidden premises, assumptions, hegemonic content, with ethical opposition such as um, our versus foreign, civilized versus primitive, and so on. This is something more than just describing stereotypes, uh, than just patterns uh, of how we describe people from different nations and cultures. Above all, we point out the nature of colonial domination. Economic, military, yes, but above all, cultural. It's about creating a situation, this is a concept by Said, where um, that inferior culture can only express itself in a borrowed language from the dominant discourse, either by repeating these stereotypes um, or distancing themselves from them, but still, the, even by distancing or criticizing those stereotypes, they need to use the same language of the hegemonic discourse. To transfer this to the world of art, the reception of cubism in Poland or the Czech Republic, uh, in the past it was Czechoslovakia at that time, it could be described as a more or less successful imitation of real cubism, or it could be described as independent experiments similar to cubism that uh, want to react to cu cubism. So a goal of post-colonial studies is to disintegrate the function in the existing historic narratives and established identities. There is a clear paradox, a conflict of two assumptions. The first claims that identity is fluid and purely conventional, so an individual can be shaped in any way, and it's not a given. So the paradox is that in European cultures, and non-European cultures have the right to regain their identity, to liberate themselves from the pressure of European cultures, so they would have the, some predetermined permanent form. For me, it's a paradox. Of course, there is an alternative. It arises when it seems unnecessary to assume that the issue of cultural relations is always violent in nature. Picasso came to Paris, but it doesn't mean that he was colonized by French culture. Modernists seeking to regenerate European art recognize the superiority of uh, visual arts present in tribal arts, the so-called primitive art, not to conquer or colonize that culture using the language or c visual conventions that have already existed in Europe. No, they, uh, quite the contrary, they um, wanted to, they thought that that primitive art was superior to European concepts. But the critical potential of postcolonial studies, even if I do not agree with uh, the vision of um, identity of human individual, I think that there are some good practices that can, we can benefit from by revealing the hidden. The best example would be projections that you might know uh, by Krzysztof Wodiczko, especially the projection uh, on the facade of the San Diego Museum of Man, during which the artist projected um, on that building. The building uh, was um, celebrating the opening of the Panama Canal, and the uh, projection was a pair of hands uh, with rich rings or with knife and uh, holding a knife and fork waiting for a meal. And next to it was a pair of hands uh, handcuffed together with a sickle and a basket full of exotic appetizing fruit. So this is the comment on the meaning of the um, objects on display within inside that building. The next one, please. 
the opening when we uh, had the freedom to travel to Western countries, uh, we see a projection on the Lenin uh, monument. So a tourist, uh, typical tourist that came from either Russia or other post-Soviet countries, they had like a cart with, uh, they bought electronics abroad and they brought that back home. And this is something that was projected onto the Lenin's uh, monument. So the mm, critical potential has now become the very content of the institutionalized activity. It's a question of language, like Agnieszka mentioned, that was super interesting what she said. And also um, the fact that there are some artistic or scientific entities being created to reveal some uh, post-colonial uh, heritage, like the University of Arts of London, where the Decolonizing Arts Institute has been established. In many places, there are also actions um, to change the permanent collections of museums, to eliminate certain works of art, and to display others more if they are critical um, in their meaning, when they criticize the discourse that was considered hegemonic. We also witness ways of neutralizing monuments. These are signs of domination. Other elements of public space are treated in a similar way if they are a sign of cultural hegemony. Tipping monuments is an um, activity that humans have been doing since uh, the beginning of civilization, since, since we were capable of building monuments. They were always built, then torn down, rearranged. Inscriptions were changed, usually um, in relation to some violent social events. And there are many examples in Central and Eastern Europe, especially after 1989. Those were debates related to monuments that glorified communism in a way or were linked to communism. I think that those uh, images that you can see, you know, like images from Warsaw, that some of us uh, remember quite well how the monument was torn down. It was uh, a Dzierżyński uh, monument, statue. So what we can ask here is whether those situations can be compared with the demolition of the McDonald monument uh, on the previous slide. That was the uh, first prime minister of Canada. It happened in Montreal. Or the destruction of Confederate monuments in the US or monuments to Columbus. The problem arises when two different kinds of memory come into conflict, or rather post-memories. This didn't happen in the case of Dzierżyński because for most of us, it was a symbol of a communist criminal. But what is characteristic here is that other post-communist monuments in Poland were not demolished in such a violent way. The campaign to remove monuments has a, ra a rather short history in Poland. It's overlapped uh, with political divisions, of course. Post-communist uh, monument uh, problem is we try to solve it somehow. In Budapest, for example, uh, memento parks uh, are created. It started in 1993. And in Druskiniki, Gruta, Parkas. It's also a park where those post-communist monuments are gathered. Momento Park in Budapest is a public um, serious um, project, while Gruto Parkas in Druskiniki in Lithuania is a commercial project. It's like a theme park. An example that is currently under discussion in Poland is the monument by Xawery Dunikowski, a famous uh, Polish sculpture um, in the city of Olsztyn. 
uh, northeastern Poland. Right now, this uh, monument, um, the, there has been a decision, administrative decision, to demolish this monument. It's one of the monuments that were so-called gratitude monuments for the Red Army, for liberating Poland, for fighting German occupiers. The point is that uh, this part of the pre-war German state was not liberated by the Soviet army, but rather conquered by it. Therefore, there is a conflict of different kinds of memory, this different historical narratives. One of them remembers Red Army as brutal s rapists and robbers. This is Both of them are post-memories, rather. And the other one is a memory of a victorious army that defeated the Nazi Germany. The third voice is there. They say they argue that uh, those monuments should stay in our cities because they have high artistic value independently of their in the ideological content. So there is a um, dispute with the author local authorities whether those monuments should be demolished or not. It also depends on the party that is um, in power. A clear example of this is another monument, or rather quasi-monument, perhaps you remember, I mean the artistic action uh, by uh, Jerzy Bogdan Szumczyk in 2013 next to a um, Soviet tank, T-34. He uh, put a sculpture depicting a Soviet soldier raping a pregnant woman. Maybe you remember uh, there was a scandal, the artist had problems, he was uh, prosecuted, the installation was dismantled. So um, the charges he faced were of indecency, violation of public morality. And it was 2013 in our um, common conscience uh, there was a um, historically adequate image of the Red Army. And also when it comes to the intellectual world, it was a kind of a truism that we that it's about an equivalence of different historical narratives but this particular narrative the one about rape was not allowed i think that those acts of uh, postcolonial activism should be discussed those uh, linked with the woke movement it's like a protest movement that wants to cancel any ma mass manifestation of a lack of respect uh, towards minorities that are arbitrarily defined. The origin of that ideology should be uh, sought um, among the representatives of the Frankfurt School who considered that social justice, not injustice, not only stems from unequal economic relations, but also oppressive social structures that negatively affect individuals, both uh, psychologically and uh, politically, according to Marx and Freud. So Mark, uh, Marx and Freud were combined together. This philosophical formation planted um, the whole Western civilization on the bench. The point is, however, that paradoxically, this woke movement based on compassion for uh, persecuted uh, groups or individuals, paradoxically um, practices uh, censorship, um, takes away uh, freedom of speech of those people who have uh, different opinions. And as uh, Vivek Ramaswamy argues in his uh, recent book that was recently translated into Polish, the rapid spread of woke ideas is the result of masking corporate interests by appropriating uh, freedom of speech and the processes of identity formation by capitalism. It's an um, Indian origin American uh, businessman, and uh, Ramaswamy, and he argues that big corporations cause the erosion of democratic order as a result of colonization of public space where we exchange ideas and thoughts. But big investment groups or big tech companies are not subject to democratic control. Another reason is probably, according to Andrzej Zybertowicz, uh, is the social role of wokeism that becomes like a new religion and fills certain void in the spiritual sphere. Such phenomena where 
previously uh, present in our culture, like theosophy was a filler for spirituality at the beginning of the 20th century and the end of the 19th century. I know I have, uh, I should be coming to an end. I just want to speak about whether this post-colonial perspective is valid when it comes to Central and Eastern Europe. Of course, uh, those countries like Poland were also subject to political, military, and economic expansion of other countries. Coming back to Said and the perspective of understanding um, post-colonialism, in which the decisive fact is that the colonized somehow borrows the language of the colonizer to describe themselves and to construct their own identity, doing that um, from a position of inferiority in terms of civilization, then in Central and Eastern Europe, this didn't happen um, in terms of Russia and Germany uh, conquering us. So I think that economic exploitation and political subjugation do not always create this characteristic, this colonial relationship, because we did not internalize mentally this subordination. In the times of communist enslavement, of course, um, groups and um, individuals didn't have the right to self-determine themselves. There was a lot of censorship, but we never borrowed language. We did have a former tradition in Poland. We also had um, people living abroad, uh, emigration diaspora. So there was no need to borrow uh, language of other people. So it's realism, social realism, in my opinion, was not colonialism. This question is quite uh, complex, but uh, this is just my opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, to end uh, my speech, I would like to go back to uh, the world of art. Recently departed uh, friend, uh, Piotr Piotrowski from the uh, Poznan Institute of Art. He wanted to um, create alter global art history to respond to the problems uh, of writing the so-called global art history. And he uh, said that post-colonial studies are not uh, the best fitted uh, to European reality. However, they have a big potential, and this should be um, used because art history should take on uh, tasks that on a global scale would uh, expose the repressive practices of the margins, the periphery, both on a geographical and topographical scales. This uh, challenge uh, was previously taken up by other artists coming out of the Schillerian tradition. It was conceived as a means that art was a means of social repair. What is also interesting is that the most important element of the critical potential of postcolonial studies, uh, the mm, construction of identity by using language uh, offered by the colonizer and assimilated as one's own, was not addressed by uh, contemporary Polish artists. For example, the period of transformation after 1989 in Poland and in other countries from the region has not become a subject of intense artistic analysis or artistic activity. But this is a topic for another qu quite a long discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Piotr. Uh, lots of um, uh, complex thoughts there. We're going to move straight with uh, Inea, and then we will open out for uh, a wider conversation. Inea. Hello. Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to this discussion. Uh, really fascinating uh, thoughts from my co-panelists, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing much more of the questions. Um, so this is the first slide. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, not as an art or cultural historian or an artist, but um, as a writer and journalist who's been thinking and, and discussing and writing about these issues for some years now. And, and really understanding how, whilst there's a really interesting and important body of scholarship um, around post-colonial studies and so on, how is this uh, discourse, how is this narrative actually being experienced um, in popular culture? 
and, and by ordinary people um, in their day-to-day -day lives and day-to-day -day interactions. So the discussion surrounding the concept of decolonization and its associated movement, particularly in Western societies, has gained a, a lot of prominence over the last decade, but particularly accelerated, at least in the UK um, and America, uh, following uh, the uh, uh, infamous uh, murder of George Floyd um, at the hands of a police officer in 2020. And I think, you know, this movement, um, as has been outlined, ostensibly uh, argues that it is trying to uh, in improve uh, society, reduce inequality, address historical uh, injustices, particularly um, committed by Western countries. So the transatlantic slave trade, colonialism, imperialism, very uh, hugely influential parts of history and very important to look at. But it says that it is uh, trying to uh, redress historical injustices by deconstructing and subverting Converting the supposed racist colonial origins of, of many aspects of social, cultural, and political life. And this movement is having a huge impact on, on the arts and cultural sector um, in the UK and beyond, and is raising some really important and legitimate questions, such as how should we understand the past, morality and judgment, the boundaries of artistic freedom and, and expression. So to understand the uh, tensions and challenges within this discussion, I think it's really important and crucial that we first establish the definitions. So colonialism, I think, as is widely understood for most people, is where one country or, or group of countries or empire um, control a particular people or territory by establishing colonies, taking over the governance, the economic and political life of a particular context. And therefore, in that understanding, to decolonize refers to the removal um, of a foreign power, uh, a foreign ruling power. However, contemporary uh, discussions of decolonization, I would argue, is very different, and it differs from uh, the, the previous understanding. What is talked about um, in the discourse now is an attempt to eliminate any remnants of cultural, uh, social, or moral knowledge or customs perceived to have foreign origins, often associated with, at least uh, in the UK and America, with supposed white Western origins. Whilst connected, I think it presents a very significant departure from previous understandings, and, and actually that has very significant implications. I would argue that formal decolonization represents political and economic agency, self-governance, self-determination, and is involved in reclaiming one's own destiny of their nation and, and directing it in a particular direction. Whereas the latter, I think, is something different. I would argue that it actually has a, almost an anti-human element as it seeks to disregard or disrupt the continual uh, human process of creating and reshaping culture, often seeking to define certain expressions, ideas, philosophies, and ways um, of being as in distinctly oppositional racial terms. And I think... I don't want to uh, sound one-sided. I think there is nuance in this, this discussion. So if we just go on to the next slide. I don't know if people know who uh, this, this woman is. This is uh, a famous uh, supermodel called Naomi Campbell. And one of the things that's very interesting is, uh, is a movement that I was really uh, uh, looking into uh, in, in the early 2010s. It's called the Natural Hair Movement. And it um, emerged in the mid-20th century in the 1960s in America, um, but really uh, regained prominence again um, in the early 2010s and, and, and the late 2000s. And it was essentially a movement of uh, particularly women of African heritage who uh, were trying to push back on representations of uh, African origin features and African hairs as inferior and, and ugly in many ways. And many of these women, uh, uh, quite organically, quite grassroots, uh, rejected that and sought to uh, wear their hair in its natural way without straightening it and embracing and subverting um, certain uh, understandings from racism uh, to, to depict and to reflect the real beauty of African features. I think one of the things that's quite difficult in this discussion is to differentiate from what I would argue are very uh, important and, uh, and very great ways in which previously uh, victimized uh, minorities uh, seek to reclaim uh, wrong and inappropriate and negative representations, which, what I, which um, between what I think is happening now, which is something very different. This movement is much more about individual empowerment, um, whereas I would argue that uh, the decolonizing discourse that we have now is actually reinforcing um, certain assumptions that perhaps uh, this movement was trying to reject.
So I'm just going to uh, go into that a, a bit deeper. So the first problem, the first contention I have with the discourse um, around decolonization and its impact in wider society is actually far from uh, bringing to light uh, minority perspectives that were historically marginalized. Actually, oftentimes, it erases history and erases uh, historical complexity by uh, simplifying the past and presenting a one-sided idea of colonialism as purely an oppressive force, neglecting the complex interactions, collaborations, and conflicts that occurred in the colonial period. And I think an example that really represents this um, is a portrait by uh, somebody called Ayuba Suleiman Diallo um, at the National Portrait Gallery, and as a trustee, something that I'm, I'm very interested in. Um, so he was uh, around uh, in the 18th century, and he was a prominent uh, Muslim prince from West Africa, from the uh, Fulani tribe, and he was kidnapped and trafficked to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade. Interestingly, and I think this is a really important detail, having previously owned and sold slaves uh, himself, and what's really quite astonishing about his sto story, after his supporters uh, helped him gain freedom, he actually returned to Africa in 1738 to work for the Royal Africa Company, um, which was a company during the British Empire, which was uh, involved in uh, a lot of harmful practices. And, uh, he was, uh, and it was also active in the slave trade, and he worked for that company for the rest of his life. And so I think this is just one example, and there are many others, but I think this is just one example of when we think about things through the lens of this decolonizing discourse, we can actually miss the complexities of many historical figures. How, can we really understand him as um, through a solely a oppressor versus oppressed lens? Where does he fit in um, in these stories? And I think oftentimes when we look at things through this discussion, we actually overlook uh, the different uh, ethnic minorities and like, stories from the global south that don't neatly fit into uh, this particular narrative. So one of my uh, primary uh, can, uh, problems with the discourse is how, as I said, it uh, erases historical memory and deprives us of a nuanced understanding of our own history, which is actually a very rich source of meaning and identity. And it was just talked about uh, some theories about uh, the origins of woke or why it exists is actually a, a new religion. Um, and oftentimes, the, the old stories, the old places of meaning that we can take from are, are actually rich sources of meaning without needing to uh, create new religions and so on. So I think it fails to acknowledge uh, diverse experiences and perspectives from, from both the colonized um, and those doing the colonizing. And then my second uh, problem with it is I think uh, it attacks moral judgment. So by categorizing historical figures and actions solely through modern or contemporary ethical lenses, we impose present-day moral standards on individuals and societies from the past, often leading to overly harsh criticism and condemnation. Whilst it's, of course, essential to analyze and assess historical injustice, this approach can, again, undermine a more nuanced evaluation of the moral complexities and evolving ethical standards of different time periods. And so I want to point to another controversy that's uh, happened in the UK. Um, so this is a uh, controversy over an exhibition, a Hogarth exhibition, uh, which was at the Tate Britain um, in London. And the Telegraph, which is a, uh, a conservative newspaper, wrote, William Hogarth is an artist uh, known for his satirical depictions of the 18th century, never more so than his images of drunken debauchery. But an exhibition at Tate Britain has suggested that his pictures are no laughing matter because their subjects are drunk on the spoils of slavery. And so a woman uh, called Sonia Barrett, a visual artist and sculptor, uh, who uses 18th century furniture in her work, um, had commentary to accompany uh, some of the pictures in the exhibition. And one of the commentaries said, the chair is made from timbers shipped from the colonies via routes which also shipped enslaved people. Could the chair also stand in for all those unnamed black and brown people, enabling the society that supports his vigorous creativity? So I think this is just an example of uh, something that... Uh, it, the reason I would argue that this is attacking moral judgment is because it's actually preventing people from uh, enjoying the artwork, coming to their own conclusions, and is in, uh, drenching it in a particularly 
contemporary uh, moral understanding, and not just the modern contemporary understanding, but one that's actually usually from a very specific area of the political spectrum. So there's a lot of political ideology um, that is uh, really gatekeeping and preventing uh, members of the public from being able to come to their own conclusion. And is essentially suggesting, well, we cannot really enjoy a humor or, or, or things that happened uh, several hundred years ago because all of it must be tainted, all of it uh, must be uh, infused with uh, the, the evil of colonialism and the evil of that period. And I, th I think there's something deeply anti-democratic about that. I think that's deeply uh, anti-human. Um, and I think that it actually makes us estranged, makes, makes us distant um, from our past because it means that uh, the past is this place of, of, of evil um, and there's nothing about that that we can take from, we can learn from, we can really appreciate. We can only uh, stay in the present. So. I think that this, another example, uh, just to highlight this point a, a little further, um, and this is a quite a complicated uh, historical example, but this is a debate going on in, in Britain at the moment, and it's also about the return of the Benin Bronzes. So uh, the Benin Bronzes are a series of brass uh, plaques looted, and they were looted by the British in uh, 1897 from modern day Nigeria many of which are now um, on display in the British Museum. But actually what is, uh, the, the discussion is about that we, we looted these things and that we should return it. But I think one of the problems is what is not actually discussed is um, the, the, the empire where the Benin bronzes were created were also Grew, grew rich from the transatlantic slave trade and actually just trading um, African slaves. So it really does raise questions that um, are they an example of a kind of great uh, African civilization uh, and should be, they be returned or are they also a product of, of uh, violence and slavery uh, and uh, subjugation from the society itself? And again, in the UK, it's very difficult to have those kinds of nuanced discussions and to hear the different ranges of perspectives that actually don't always paint uh, Europe as the sole um, instigator of evil actions. And I think one of the problems is, in the name of uh, uh, challenging supposed white supremacy, um, what we do is actually create a new form of uh, white Eurocentrism, which says that all of the problems, all of the bad things of the world are solely a product of a singular area, and all of the other parts of the world are, are just victims. And, and I think that, that that actually undermines human agency, and I think um, that actually raises the status um, of Western Europeans, I think, perhaps beyond uh, what I think is actually appropriate. And so I think that the next thing that I want to just talk about is a, a more light-hearted uh, discussion. And I think one of the things that, the last problem that I want to just talk about is that I think one of the, the decolonizing discourse uh, oversimplifies identities. It reduces individuals and cultures to fixed monolithic categories. And this essentialism can hinder efforts to acknowledge the diverse experiences and identities within communities, thus often perpetuating stereotypes and divisive thinking. And it often might inadvertently marginalize those identities um, that don't actually fit into predefined categories. Um, so just take this example very quickly. I don't know if people know who this woman is. She's a, a very famous uh, British singer called Adele. Um, and she is at a carnival uh, called Notting Hill Carnival, which was uh, founded in the UK um, in the mid-20th century um, when there was a large influx of uh, people uh, from the Caribbean who are British. And uh, this festival was created in order to celebrate West Indian culture and to integrate uh, white British people with uh, the, the Caribbean and, and other diverse communities that existed in London at the time. And she was uh, born and raised in London. She's been uh, raised in a very uh, multicultural uh, community. And she was criticized very strongly by certain uh, activists online um, in the name of the decolonizing discourse. So she's got um, a particular hairstyle, which is an African-inspired hairstyle called Bantu Knots. 
and she's got the Jamaican flag on, on her bikini and just dressed in a general carnival way. And many people said that this was a form of something called cultural appropriation. Um, essentially this idea that um, people from dominant cultures um, should not uh, embrace or should not wear or should not um, represent themselves by minority cultures because that's essentially a form of stealing and disrespecting of that culture. And actually to me, I think it's the exact opposite. Um, I think that this is a really beautiful example of um, collaboration, exchange, cultures mixing, and creating new things that, um, uh, that weren't there before. I think this is the real kind of concrete impacts, I think, um, regardless of some of the positive intentions and some of the origins. It actually, uh, what it often does is uh, reduce the freedom of individuals to experiment, to explore, uh, to exercise their agency, and to reinvent themselves. And I think it can have a very patronizing aspect, but also um, could undermine the, the fundamental creative spirit. And just one more example, uh, very quickly. Um, this is, uh, this photo over here um, is from a, a, a religious community in South America, particularly in Cuba called Santeria. And uh, it emerged um, following the transatlantic slave trade. And the photo over there is influenced by two religions in particular. One is, again, uh, an indigenous religion from Nigeria called Ifa Divination, which is a kind of spiritual, animistic, uh, kind of polytheistic type of a, a religion. And then the second one is Catholicism. And that during, following the transatlantic slave trade, many of the, the, uh, the former slaves and their descendants actually still kept elements of this indigenous West African religion, but also embraced many aspects of Catholicism. And to me, this is, this is another example of actually uh, how the, the decolonial narrative, it is, it's hard to really, un it can't understand these kinds of examples because, because it's actually created something new, bringing in uh, Western origin cultures and, and ideas, but also uh, fusing it with um, other cultures to create something quite exciting. So just to bring it back round to um, the question of whether or not this applies to Central and Eastern European countries, I would argue that in many ways it doesn't apply to Western countries, even though they're the, the ones that are uh, perpetuating it across the world. And while, whilst it might look like this is a dominant uh, conversation, uh, within uh, America and within the UK, there's, it, it's actually, there's many people disagreeing, there's a very live debate going on. And so the question of whether or not it applies to Western countries is I think just as important. And I, I would argue that um, it doesn't fit very neatly in Western countries, let alone um, Eastern European countries. So the crux of my point is that there are better ways to um, morally understand the past. And I think that um, here we should think critically um, and, and view it with skepticism uh, when we are embracing uh, the decolonizing discourse. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inaya. Um, I'm going to open it out straight out to the audience because we have just over 20 minutes uh, uh, time uh, and very complex um, thoughts from a very contemporary, I would say, sort of, you know, neo-colonial uh, imperative of the European Union um, and obviously the relationship between the past and the present and memory is so important in, in some of the discussions we talked about. And also not to take things too seriously, perhaps. You know, it's, uh, uh, back in the 90s and the 80s, cultural hybridity was the buzzword. No one talks about cultural hybridity anymore. You know, it's, uh, it's about decolonization. Um, so that's an interesting shift in the last 20 or 30 years. Anyway, uh, that's a quick thought from me. Um, but let's uh, get it out to you. Who wants to uh, fire away with the first question or thought? It's not just that white people enslaved other people, all people enslaved other people. And as you, uh, when you were telling me about this prince, I never heard about him before. That's very interesting that he became a slave and then came back to the slave business. Um, tell me, uh, there is this myth, or is it true, that so many white people were enslaved by the Ottoman Empire, today Turkey, that the uh, English word slave derives from the word Slav, which means Słowianie, which is Polish people, Ukrainian people, Belarusian people, and all of that. Uh, do you think that's true, or is it just an urban myth? Because when I was researching it, 
nobody actually had any doubts that the word slave derives from Slav. Thank you. I think that's a really uh, important and interesting observation. Um, who would like to um, uh, respond to that question? Uh, I mean, I don't mind. Yeah, I mean, I think it's quite possible. Um, and I, it is true that lots of different uh, people uh, slave, uh, were slaves um, and were enslaved. Undoubtedly, though, obviously, being in Europe, we are going to focus more on our history, and it's understandable uh, that we might look more about the type of slavery that is the most recent and the one that was the most impactful um, to shaping contemporary society. So in a sense, I can understand why there are lots of discussions that constantly happen, at least in the UK and America. Uh, I mean, America in particular, because uh, the, the founding of America, uh, the, slave, the transatlantic slave trade was very much intrinsic to that founding. So, and it's a very new country um, as well. And so that, that history is still very raw and very present. Um, so I think it's true, and I can also understand, though, why uh, the focus is often on these things. But I think, as I, um, I hope out I outlined in the discussion, I think there is a danger that um, the narrative is one-sided, and actually the discussion about it is much more about today's political problems um, rather than any serious engagement with, with, a historical, uh, with history. Piotr, have you got any thoughts on that? I'm uh, not, not a, a specialist in, in uh, uh, linguistics, so I'm not sure um, about the origin of, the, um, uh, of this word. But uh, if I can, uh, can comment on uh, something uh, else, something more. Uh, 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 you, you were talking about a new uh, narrative, which um, uh, was, uh, let's say, um, uh, create a new context for uh, Hogarth's painting. And it uh, reminds me the situation uh, in uh, Poland in um, the, about uh, 1955 when um, uh, Picasso uh, uh, was, uh, of course, slightly cr criticized uh, because of the, the, the shape of his art. Also Matisse, uh, for example. But um, uh, 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 in this uh, situation, also the uh, new uh, narrative was uh, constructed. I, uh, it means that um, their art uh, was uh, a kind of uh, protest against uh, capitalism. So it is right, it is uh, politically cor correct. So uh, it was um, a historical absurd, but uh, it was the kind of the new uh, narratives uh, toward this uh, kind of art. Um, Yes. In a governance perspective, do you, do you think governments are, are sort of uh, in fear of, of, a, of, this, of, of, of a popular movement against, you know, in, in these ideas of, uh, you know, decolonization and, and wokeness, etc.? Are they sort of in fear of it or are they orchestrating it or, you know, what's, what's the relationship between a popular, what might be a popular movement and, and, and the government, people in power, so what, what are your, what's your take? I mean, I could try, but obviously it's not easy, so it would be like some kind of playing with ideas and so on, but not like something set in stone. Um, I think there could be different things at play and different actors use it for different, um, aims, they, 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 have, they want to achieve different objectives. So I would say that for anyone wishing for the Western civilization to be undermined and to go down like particular countries and so on, it's a great tool to, to create a discord and, and um, um, chaos within these societies from a side. So, it's, it's a great thing to happen. So let's say having now social media and being able to establish accounts and create certain um, movements and energies at play that um, emotionally stir people up, it's great that there is this discord in the, in the West about the colonizing and about the divided society and we want to reach justice and diverting attention from 
what the Chinese government is doing around the world, how um, they have influence in different countries, what they're doing in their own country. So different actors, they, they would find it very useful, as a useful tool. But then when it comes to elites, and then um, uh, Professor mentioned uh, Vivek's book, for corporations, it's a great tactic to di divert attention from their practices, business practices, using the sweatshops, um, manipulating the local populations where they're having their factories, how they're investing money, what they're doing with the minerals, with, with the resources, and so on and so forth. Um, and for the governing elites, it keeps us busy <laughs> fighting between each other and just getting upset. And, and as I was saying early on, talking about the, the European um, funding for arts and creativity, um, we could, we could see it as something uh, harmless, while at the same time being really preoccupied with the past and, and fighting over it, but not really thinking what is currently happening and whether we agree with everything, whether certain things are still need more discussion and then deciding on the course of action and it's not something just given to us. And when it comes to the slave trade and, and, and slavery, why we don't talk about the modern day slavery? we don't put enough energy into that. So it's all great if people go and kneel in Qatar during the football match, but then they don't look at the use of workers building the stadiums there and dying there and other places around the world where it's happening. So there's an element of hypocrisy and just diverting our attention somewhere else. I think it's... I think it's right that um, there's lots of different things going on. Um, whether or not any of the uh, political elites governing classes genuinely believe this, uh, a lot of the, the stuff that um, I outlined, it, it remains to be seen. But I think uh, particularly in uh, uh, Britain and America, I think a lot of our political elites have lost confidence in liberal ideals, the kinds of things that um, they would champion um, in their own societies and, and elsewhere. And I think one of the things about the decolonizing discourse and the broader discourse um, around uh, race and identity and gender is that it, it gives a lot of people a new moral authority. It gives them a new purpose. You know, well, Why defend freedom of speech and uh, democracy? And a lot of these ideals uh, that a lot of them feel have been uh, either discredited or no longer give the same uh, elite status as they used to, uh, championing minorities, championing a lot of these other things is now what's in. And so I think a lot of it is actually an opportunistic uh, desire to have um, a new purpose rather than actually having faith in, in democracy, having faith in the, the foundations of, of Western liberal society. One more thing just came to my mind on that, what Inaya was saying, that. What I came across in Britain that quite often on the lower, the lower classes would mix and they will get on, but the higher you go up, they would have all these ideals, but they would never put them in practice. I think that's a fair point. Good observation. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for these uh, interesting presentations a lot of uh, problems, interesting topics, but I'd like to concentrate on one uh, problem uh, uh, Piotr uh, uh, mentioned in his, uh, in his presentation. It is uh, this uh, uh, idea of uh, using uh, um, post-colonial uh, studies, post-colonial theory, but in some critical way, and especially use it as, a, uh, um, or, uh, uh, as a, some artistic strategy. And I think that it is very interesting, and uh, uh, I wonder if you, uh, s uh, if you have occasion to see the Badusao exhibition in, in, in the castle now. Uh, I think it is a very good example of this, of this strategy, uh, because the Badusao is a Chinese artist uh, um, who now uh, uh, lives in, uh, in, 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 in Australia. Uh, but in his exhibition, he adopted uh, uh, many languages of the Western art, not only contemporary art, but also, you know, uh, old art, like, for example, uh, Goya um, uh, paintings, yes? Uh, and I think it is a very uh, uh, conscious way of using uh, the Western language 
uh, or different artistic languages uh, by the Chinese artist uh, as a, some kind of the, of the weapon or the tool to criticize the Chinese government, you know? It is not a, a weak country, yes, it is one of the, of the, of the, of the world superpower now. But uh, it is not only critical uh, toward uh, uh, China, uh, but also toward the West. And it is uh, also aimed to, uh, uh, to criticize the, the West uh, um, uh, way to, 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 to support uh, uh, China, yes? Not to, uh, to criticize or to see uh, of all these uh, uh, bad things and, 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 and uh, um, uh, the horrors, yes, that uh, occur uh, occur in, in in China, but you know to support China and uh, send money and you know, invest in China. So I think this is a very interesting uh, example of such a using of uh, of uh, of, uh, of um, this post-colonial uh, uh, theory as a critical as a critical instrument. I, I wonder if uh, if uh, if Piotr will uh, uh, would agree with 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 me. If uh, uh, do you do you think that uh, the Piotr Piotrowski uh, thought about this uh, way of using uh, of using uh, um, uh, different languages from different 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 cultures. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I'm, I don't know uh, exactly um, uh, what he was uh, in uh, in mind. Uh, but um, I think uh, yes, that it is um, uh, critical potential. Uh, which could be uh, adopted by uh, by the artists, and as I said, it's uh, rather rather um, a strange uh, situation in which uh, um, Polish artists, um, after uh, 1989, uh, didn't try to to to, to use this uh, um, critical poten uh, potential to uh, describe uh, the situation of um, uh, political and uh, economical. Uh, transformation in Poland. Uh, I think that um, uh, would be a lot of uh, occasions to to to, uh, to try uh, analyze uh, the language uh, of uh, this time, uh, the the um, iconography of this time, and so on and so on. We uh, probably uh, uh, all uh, remember that um, uh, then. I mean, uh, after the uh, 1989. The word uh, "normal" or "normality" was in uh, use in Poland. We are we are not still normal like uh, West, like Western countries. So still there is a gap, and we will try to to, to fill the gap to uh, to um, uh, be um, uh, closer to the West. And um, uh, this problem um, uh, wasn't analyzed at all. And, and uh, by 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 young and um, uh, and Polish artists, but, but maybe this is the problem of self colonization, yes, probably, which yes. was uh, in fact uh, formulated in some in the theory of some uh, uh, um, uh, scholars from from Bulgaria, I think, Kiosef, who who formulated you know the idea of self self colonization. Hello, thank you for this interesting discussion. Um, I think uh, as I have the opportunity to live in different continents of my work, in Europe, in Asia, in Africa, my viewpoint is still Europe kind of uh, have an ethnocentric viewpoint of many things. So my question is, don't you think that, do you think that still Europe has to give lessons to the rest of the world now in 2023 because also um, since also we talk about globalized time, uh, everything happens also in different areas like in Asia. Also, for example, if you see the uh, rankings of important work of art, 100, 1000, or even cinema, most of these works are from the Western world. They tend to forget uh, or to, uh, uh, to show in a folkloric manner what happens, let's say, in Asia and Africa. So I'd like to know if, uh, not for the past, but what will happen in the future, 
if we want to see a film good, if we want to get an exhibition, first the film has to get a prize in Cannes Film Festival, and maybe it will be recognized. Same to my understanding in Poland, if the director has a special award in some festival in France, okay, maybe you will be distributed in Poland. So um, uh, this uh, Western hegemony is uh, also seriously uh, put into question. Thank you. My question is for Piotr. Uh, as an art historian, do you think it's the lack of good modern art that leads us to talk about things like this? Um, ex not quite external, but not quite getting to the heart of what art is. Um, and or do you think it's maybe a hundred years of modernism and postmodernism doing down the idea that there can be good art or that we are allowed value judgments about art? Are we then forced into talking about the politics of art rather than the aesthetic merits of, of what art is for, for us? Okay, so we will address two questions there. Um, your, your question, and uh, so we've got three minutes. <laughs> Who wants to? Uh, I think I, I, I don't know if I understood the question exactly correctly. Just uh, were, were you asking me, uh, were you asking the panel uh, whether uh, because that when it comes to recognition and when it comes to awards, there's still a Western dominance, mm. and, and that yeah. whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, or whether or not that should change? Is that, yeah? yeah. Yeah, so um, a few things. I think, well, I think part of the reason why this discussion is actually being had in, in, in the West is because that there is an increasing anxiety, an increasing lack of confidence in whether or not Western dominance is going to continue for the next um, century. And uh, I know in the UK, there's a lot of discussions you know, around uh, the dominance of China and the rising dominance of countries like India and what that's going to mean uh, for the future and the position of America and Britain in, in the world going forward. So I think that um, this might just change by virtue of the fact that economic, military, and political power um, is going to, and is transforming um, quite substantially right now, but over the next uh, uh, century. And so I think it might change by, by, by virtue of just the, the facts um, about the world changing. And I think that is actually part of why um, these new ideas, these new values and things are emerging, because there's a lack of confidence in, in, in a the future uh, of Western civilization. I do believe that um, uh, liberal democracy still has a lot to bring to the world. You know, I am someone that believes that. I know that there's um, other ideas like an illiberal democracy or, you know, other countries have different models of governing. But I do think that um, the ideal of realizing a freer, more open, more democratic society is, is a good one. You know, my, my um, heritage, as I mentioned earlier, is Nigerian. And there are many young people, and there are many movements and struggles to try and realize a much more uh, democratic form of governance. So whilst the world is changing, um, I still think that there is a lot of good um, that is coming out of, of uh, West, the West historically. And I think that we should, and that's something to be proud of. Thank you. Would you like to final thoughts um, on some of the reflections we've had? About art. Mm. <laughs> uh, yes. You know, uh, classical uh, modernists um, uh, tried to change the world using art, of course. And uh, they, uh, first of all, uh, tried to create a new man uh, who... Uh, uh, who was to be uh, more talented, uh, more uh, physically um, developed, and so on. And uh, they also uh, tried to create um, a new friendly uh, space for uh, such a new man. And I would say that um, uh, artists today also try to, to, to change the world. Um, uh, but uh, they... Uh, used uh, this, uh, uh, this universal language uh, about which uh, Agnieszka was talking about. 
uh, uh, classical uh, modernists were also um, um, reformers that tried to uh, make uh, new flats, uh, new visuality, and so on and so on. And um, uh, we also uh, should talk about when, where uh, this uh, discourse is born and uh, when, uh, where is, uh, uh, the discourse is uh, produced. I am from time to time uh, a member of some uh, national bodies which, um, uh, give, uh, gi uh, which give us uh, uh, funds for different projects. Uh, now uh, such uh, national bodies uh, have to have an, let's say, international component, and <laughs> sometimes I am such international component. And uh, this uh, language about, uh, about uh, gender, colonizing, and so on, now is universal. It's, it's practiced in the whole Europe, in, in fact. So, yes. Okay. Um, sadly, we've come to an end.